So here we are with chapter 15, Nyborg State Prison. So let's see what this is like. The fortress known as Nyborg Stratzenfengsel had 800 adult men behind a maze of red brick walls and barbed wire. Many inmates were serving sentences for violent crimes. Sometimes they were packed four to a cell. Armed and uniformed guards patrolled a walkway above the perimeter wall. About noon on September day in 1942, seven handcuffed teens spilled out their bus and stood uneasily while paperwork was completed. So they're flashing to the time period where um, all the kids are getting off the bus at the prison. As the bus pulled away f for Olborg with the driver waving them good luck, they were taken into custody by guards in black uniforms with gold buttons. The new prisoners were ushered into the high-ceilinged main building. One of the boys nervously cracked a joke, which brought a guard whirling around. All conversation is prohibited, he shouted. The boys were separated. Each was directed to empty the contents of his pockets. Every possession was confiscated, even eyeglasses and family photos. They were forced to strip naked, bend over, and receive rectal examinations. They were issued prison uniforms, long pants and a jacket that buttoned all the way down. Knud Peterson's arms and legs poked out as usual. Next, the barber got his turn. Clumps of teenagers carefully groomed hair fell to the floor beneath the electric razor when i lost most of my hair i also lost a big part of me eigel astrup frederickson later recalled the boys were led to the youth wing of the prison division k they were the only occupants each boy was issued a cell number and a personal number knud peterson now prisoner 28 stepped into cell one jens peterson prisoner number 30 was locked into cell two from then on, guards addressed the boys by their numbers. Get up, 30, instead of their names. Each cramped cell contained an iron-framed bed, a table, and a chair. The toilet was a clay pot to be cleaned by the prisoner. Each boy got two sheets of toilet paper per day. I think some of you might have trouble with that. Two sheets of toilet paper. I have some uh, crappy-looking hands after that. As the king... As in the King Hans Gades jail, the cells consisted of four solid walls. The entrance was a heavy door with no handle on the inside, but a peephole for looking in. A small barred window looked out onto a high red brick wall, patrolled by a Danish guard. I would watch, I would watch the guy, Knud recalled. He was so bored that sometimes I could just see him counting the number of bricks on the wall with his finger. That's all he had to do. They were governed by countless rules relentlessly applied. Parents could visit only once every three months and then for only 20 minutes. Family conversations were monitored by guards. Prisoners were expected to snap to rigid attention and salute whenever the warden appeared. When it was time to go for a brief morning walk, they lined up with their noses against the brick wall, arms to their side. When released by a command, they walked 10 feet apart and remained absolutely silent. A smile could cost a meal. They were issued three skimpy meals a day. Breakfast was three slices of rye bread. Lunch was porridge. Dinner was usually a small portion of hot food. The boys quickly lost weight. One day, when I was extremely hungry, I asked a guard if I could have a portion more. Eigel later wrote. He replied angrily that they were not meant to be, become obese. He took away my meal. I lost 20 kilos, which is 44 pounds, in the first month or two. They followed a harsh daily routine. A clanging bell at six o'clock jarred them awake and sent them scrambling to their feet. They relieved themselves, washed their floors, and gobbled breakfast. Work started at seven. They worked ten hours a day in their cells, monotonously sorting mountains of postcards from the prison's print shops into bundles of twenty-five. They continued working until six in the evening. Every two weeks, they got a hot shower. On Sundays, the boys were offered the opportunity to go to church. Back home, they had eagerly skipped Reverend Peterson's church services to practice shooting the machine gun in the monastery loft, but now they jumped at any chance for a break from the prison tedium. Each of the seven boys sat alone in an enclosed booth. Each booth angled so that they could see the priest, but not one another. Each boy reacted to imprisonment on in his own way. Eigel struggled to stave off feelings of despair. 
I missed my mates, he later wrote. The loneliness was very great. In my thoughts, I convinced myself that I had done the right thing by taking part in the fight against the Germans. But in the many lonely hours came the doubt anyway, often very insidious. There was no one to talk to besides myself. The light in the cell was turned off at nine. Many times I lay in bed and struggled with my temptation to give up, to take a razor blade and slit my wrists, to stop the bleeding of my heart, the beating of my heart. It would not be discovered until I would not be discovered until four AM, I told myself. By contrast, Ufa Darkett seemed to possess an inner cheerfulness, even in the darkest of circumstances. When the others would sit on their cots, despondently staring at, out their barred windows at the dingy snow, they could often hear Ufa singing his favorite song, which began, There will be flowers in the windows where my loved ones will be living. Knud Peterson had no intention of taking his life, but he was far too angry to sing. Here's Knud Peterson's perspective, him talking. I did not adjust. I regarded the Danish jailers as German cooperators and traitors. I was an enemy. I was in enemy land. I was punished again and again at Nyborg. Mostly, they took away things. They took away my drawings, materials, and books from the prison library. For a month, they took away happy hour. Between eight and nine at night, the one time I could talk to my mates. Once I threw a bucket of water onto the guard's backside when he wasn't looking. He never forgave me. I smashed my own pocket watch onto the prison floor. They repaired it and sacked me five work days. I was punished for keeping an unclean cell, for not obeying orders, for taking my friends, for talking to my friends when ordered to shut up. And I was an easy target. I was too tall to hide behind anyone else. They tried to strip away your identity and play with your mind. There was one little guard, pudgy and red-faced, who really hated me. He would jingle his keys outside my cell. The sound would drive me crazy because I knew the person jingling them was free. He also had his spy hole in the door. I always had the feeling I was being watched. One night when I was in bed, I saw a mouse in my cell, illuminated by the moonbeam on the floor. It was just sitting there looking at me. I was terrified. I jumped up on the bed screaming. Guards came running. When they realized what was going on, they doubled up in laughter. I yelled back, you can laugh only because you have guns on you. You're safe. They slammed the door and gathered outside to watch my misery through their peephole. That mouse is going to get you, 28, the chubby guard cackled. The mouse scuttled softly around the radiator pipes and seemed to try to settle in for the night. I heard every move it made. I wrapped my sheet around my head to block out the sound, but even that didn't work. The next morning, Ufa came in, trapped the poor animal, and took it away. My obsession with Greta got worse. Now she was a goddess to me, occupying my thoughts and dreams. We were allowed to write only one letter home every two weeks, not exceeding four pages. Sometimes they were so heavily censored that almost every word was blacked out. I would use all four pages writing about Greta. My parents wanted to know about my health. I wanted a photograph of Greta. My sister would say that Greta sent her greetings. I wanted her photo. Finally, my worried family was able to obtain a photo of her. There she was, seated on the ground with five puppies. It was all I ever got. Back to the narrator. The boys hungered for news of the war, hoping the British were gaining ground against Germany. But during family visits, they were forbidden from discussing political events. Conversation was closely monitored by guards. The prison passed out a weekly newspaper entitled Near and Far Away that presented an upbeat Nazi version of the war, along with cheerful family stories and a page on sports. The boys read it over and over. Parents tried to report news, but little got past the guards who monitored their conversations. Still, information leaked. One evening at bedtime, guards ordered the boys to take off their shoes and hand them out the door. What was this? It made no sense at all. The whispered explanation came during a family visit. Knud Hornbow and... The Holborg brothers had remained in Olborg, where they had shared the cell with the dummy escape bar that Alf and Jens had fashioned. At night, they had gone out for sabotage and returned in the morning, but they had just captured, been captured during one of their escapes via the dummy window bar. Now the shoes made sense. The warden didn't want the same thing to happen at Nyborg. Take their shoes, he had ordered his guards. Let's not give these boys any ideas. Uh, this next section is just uh, telling you about uh, Vivel Vinde, which means we will win. 
It says, in 1943, the Churchill Club's impact grew steadily outside the prison walls. The British Royal Air Force airdropped leaflets telling the club's story all over Denmark in January and again in July. The second flyer concluded, the schoolboys of Olborg should be allowed to compare their actions with some of the best that take in other occupied countries. In April, the American radio series, The March of Time, dramatize the old Borg boy's sabotage. In the radio play, the tearful Danish judge ends his sentencing speech with, Be brave, boys. You will never serve your whole sentence, for brighter times will soon come to Denmark and to the whole world. Be patient. You won't have to wait long. So the British are purposely dropping all this propaganda to try to get Denmark to sort of rise up against the Germans and be proud of uh the Churchill boys. Despite the censorship, news of the war despite the censorship, news of the war seeped into the prison and traveled from cellmate to cellmate. Inmates heard of major Allied victory at El Almain in North Africa, and more progress at Stalingrad in Russia. Sometimes information came from unexpected sources. Here's Knud Peterson speaking. One day in the library, I met a prisoner who had been arrested a few months after us. He knew who we were, and he had heard that we were in Nyborg. He came pushing the book cart to each cell once once or every two weeks, offering books to read. A guard followed right behind him. The first time he came to me, he looked into my eyes and told me to select a specific book, turning to a specific page. On that page, I found a code. By spelling with combinations of underlined words and letters, I inform, I was informed about the British bombing of the shipyard Burnmeister and Wayne in Copenhagen. This was 1943, and we never met again after the war. He was brave and clever to inform me, as he did. Back to the narrator. The Churchill Club remained a potent symbol of resistance in Denmark, even as its members languished behind bars. One day, they were told to put on their civilian clothes and assemble in the main room. Waiting there was a formally dressed man with a familiar, mild face and a head of curly hair. It was the Danish Secretary of Justice, Thune Jacobson. He said he wanted to talk to them, to see how they were doing. His tone was apologetic, Igel recalled. He asked us to be patient, to understand that his work was the best he could do for the benefit of all Danes. He was not a Nazi beetle, he said. The more he talked, the more he made a fool of himself. For us, he was the one, one of the ones who aided the Germans. All right, and there's a little break here to tell you about the telegram crisis. Late in 1942, Adolf Hitler sent Denmark's king, Christian X, a warm personal telegram congratulating the king on his 72nd birthday. The king replied with a mere, my utmost thanks, signed Christian Rex. Hitler took it as a personal slight. Enraged, the Fuhrer immediately recalled his ambassador from Copenhagen and expelled the Danish ambassador from Germany. Hitler moved Werner Best, a dedicated Nazi and Gestapo member, to Copenhagen as the high commander of Denmark. So literally by just replying short, Hitler completely removed this guy out of office. Um, There's a picture of Adolf Hitler there, which is pretty interesting to just sort of look at for a minute. Uh, Here's Knud Peterson speaking. Thune was the worst kind of Nazi collaborator. He said our work had been useless because the British did not want Danes committing acts of sabotage against the Germans. But we knew it was a lie. The British had already organized a Danish sabotage force, and we knew it. He told us we should be grateful that we had good homes to return to, unlike most prisoners in the building. He made me sick. My letter to my parents... The week after his visit was so full of spite for him that the guards returned it to me three times to rewrite it. Finally, I didn't send it at all. One night, a new batch of prisoners arrived at Nyborg. Word went from one cell window to the next. They were schoolboys from Olborg. Their group was called Denmark's Freedom League. They had been inspired by us. Like us, they had been caught by the Danish police. They said they, there were many others out there, and the resistance was growing. That was the best news we got, the best sign of all. All right, so all their efforts have paid off. It's starting to spread a little bit as far as sabotage goes. Um, here's a picture of one of Canood's censored prison letters, uh, and you can see all everything black is just crossed out by the police guards. 
A prisoner's sentence at Nyborg was divided into three stages. Stage one, prisoners, the newest, had almost no privileges. Books borrowed from the prison library had to have a religious theme. Family members could write only one letter every 14 days. In stage two, things relaxed a bit. Inmates could go to a room to play table tennis or chess between 8 and 9 p.m., or they could use the happy hour, as it was called, to talk amongst themselves. In stage two, inmates could take out any book in the library. Knude Peterson used this opportunity to catch up on classic works of literature by writers such as Goethe, Schiller, and Homer. Stage two prisoners also got a small garden plot that they could use as they wished. Eigel turned his into a park with castles. Jens grew a vegetable garden. Ufa made a lovely stone garden. Knud let his grow wild. Stage two and three prisoners also got to have some hobby materials in the cell. Ufa at last got material to carve wooden airplanes. Knud got an artist's sketchbook. He intended on drawing set designs for theater plays until he noticed a warning printed on the front page. Here's Knud Peterson explaining what they're talking about. A message in bold letters read, You are not allowed to make drawings of naked women. I filled the entire sketchbook with naked girls, and when I got my porridge the next morning, I used it as glue and plastered all the walls in my cells with the drawings. This was my first art exhibition. There went all my hobby materials for the next two months. I was a terrible prisoner. <laughs> oh, man. All right, back to the narrator. One day late in 1942, a tall, slim, long-legged man wearing glasses had introduced himself to the boys as Hugo Worse Peterson. They could call him Mr. Worse. He had been sent by the prison to be their teacher, since they were still of school age. They would work in a large room designated as the schoolroom. The first task would be to complete their middle school exam. Their old textbooks were en route from Olborg, and they would study for an hour after breakfast each day, sometimes working in groups of three or four. They would study Danish, history, German, arithmetic, and geometry. They would take their written exams in their cells. Oral exams would be in the schoolroom. After months of harshness, Mr. Worsay was a breath of fresh air. He spoke to them as human beings. He arranged prison visits by well-known poets and convinced prison authorities to return the boys with watches, glasses, and family photos. He even got some of the guards to call them by their names rather than by their numbers. Here's Canood Peterson speaking. Mr. Worsay encouraged my interest in art. He gave me many more art magazines that the regulations allowed. He read Henrik Ibsen dramas to us on Sunday afternoons. He was a wonderful actor. He was especially kind to us at Christmas time, which meant a lot. It was the first Christmas any of us had away from home. Memories of family and friends flooded back. I wanted to cry, but I'd forgotten how. I finally discovered that by softly singing Christmas songs in my cell at night, I could make the tears flow down my cheeks. I sang every song I knew and wept the whole next day. Mr. Worsa made sure that we were treated specially on Christmas Eve, which is when we celebrated the holiday. We were summoned into the schoolroom and served a delicious pork steak and dessert. I decorated the room with a sculpture of a snow-covered hill. I drew a snow landscape on the chalkboard, too. We gobbled so much heavy food that night that they had to feed us fried herring on Christmas Day to absorb the fat. The whole day was wonderful. The day after, while we were cleaning up, the chubby guard, who was my nemesis, watched me silently as I pushed the snow sculpture over to the far corner. He Finally, finally he called across the room. Take good care of that thing, 28. You're going to have to bring it back next Christmas. It was a cruel reminder that I still had more than a year to go at Nyborg. He didn't have to say that. The guards were robots. Soon after New Year, Mr. Worsa saddened us boys by announcing he would be leaving Nyborg for a different assignment. Back to the narrator. In April 1943, Helga Milo and Mons Thompson, the boys who had drawn the briefest sentences, were released from prison and taken home by their families. That left five. Four months later, in late August 1943, inmates rushed to their windows when they heard the roar of airplanes. Igel wrote, I watched a large group of Allied bombers fly past. It was glorious. Now the Germans will finally get what they deserve, I thought. Three or four hours later, they flew back, but not so many of them. A little break to talk about August 29th, 1943. 
The sound of the Churchill clubbers heard outside their cells on August 29, 1943, reflected an upheaval in Danish society. Throughout the spring of 1943, Germans had become increasingly frustrated with strikes by Danish workers for higher wages. When Germans cracked down the brutal countermeasures, Danes in 33 towns stopped working. Germans issued orders prohibiting public meetings and gatherings after darks. Danes refused to cooperate. On August 29th, Germany, exasperated, took over the, gar- the government of Denmark, stationed troops at railroad stations, power plants, factories, and other key places, including, as the boys discovered, Nyborg State Prison. So this was a sort of historic day because it's the day that they realized Denmark's getting a little out of control and Germany's, to fix this, is taking over everything. So here we go. One day, German soldiers with rifles surged into the prison. In their cells, the boys could hear the clomp of heavy boots, but could not see what was going on. Rumors flew from window to window along the Division K wing. Soldiers had come to fetch them to Germany. No, they were rounding up Danish citizens who kept weapons in their home. That that actually made sense. It had been long long been rumored that Germans stored confiscated weapons in the Nyborg prison's giant loft. After hours of anxious waiting, a guard came to Division K to inform them that the Danish rulers had defied orders and Germany had taken over the government. Danish authorities had refused to accept German occupation any longer. The protectorate was over. What the boys had heard from their cell windows were the sounds of Germans attacking the Danes at Nyborg Strand and Allied planes responding. That's how I experienced August 29th, 1943, Igel wrote. At last, our country stood up and we behaved as Norwegians did. But what would it mean to the boys of the Nyborg prison? Would they now be sent to brutal Nazi masters to German prisons? Or would their prison now be run by the Gestapo? As it turned out, the day's events changed Nyborg State Prison very little. There's a picture of the Danish citizens in Olborg um, in open conflict, so fighting the Germans uh, in the towns. Here's Knud Peterson speaking. The turning point for Denmark may have been August 29th, but not much at all has changed for us. The main difference I saw was that the Danish guard outside my cell window, the one who paced back and forth counting bricks at the wall, was replaced by a German with a helmet and a rifle and a battle uniform. Soon he was counting bricks just like the Dane. All right, back to the narrator. Three weeks later, on September 18, 1943, Mons Felderup, the professor, and Eigel Astrup Fredriksen were released. Months later, Ufa Darkett, too, said his goodbyes, and the Churchill Club at Nyborg was down to the Peterson boys. They were transferred to a different unit near the adult prisoners. Here's a little um, break section to talk about the rescue of Danish Jews. On September 28, 1943, a German diplomat secretly informed Danish resistance leaders of Nazi plans to deport the Danish Jews to German concentration camps for mass execution. And this could be um, putting them in a um, gas chamber or just lining them up against the wall and shooting them all. Um, Lots of ways that they did mass execution. Danes quickly organized a nationwide effort to smuggle Jews by sea to neutral Sweden. Tipped off to the German plans, most of Denmark's Jews left Danish cities by train, by car, or on foot. Non-Jewish Danes hid them in homes, hospitals, and churches until they could be moved to Sweden. Within a two-week period, fishermen helped ferry some 7,000 200 Danish Jews and 680 of their non-Jewish family members to the safety in Sweden. The only Churchill Club member directly affected was Eigel. His mother was Jewish, and the family was deeply concerned. A mere 10 days after Eigel was released from Nyborg, he remembered, Our parish priest advised us to go underground. We left home and stayed with our friends. Fortunately, the Germans did not catch us. So after some days, we moved back home again. Uh, there's a picture of a boat lift of Danish Jews to Sweden. All right, and another um, True Comics, an American exaggerated version of the Churchill Club story, appeared in the September 1943 issue of True Comics under the title The Boy Saboteurs. 
All right, that's it for chapter 15. I'll see you next time for chapter 16, The First Hours of Freedom. Freedom.